All right, well, welcome to ATARC's Cybersecurity Executive Order 14028 and upcoming FAR rules presentation, everyone. This is put together by our Supply Chain Risk Management Working Group as their third event in their web webinar series, and Kelly Arts, our guest speaker for today. Um, ATAR stands for Advanced Technologies Academic Research Center and is a nonprofit that facilitates collaboration between government, industry, and academia in order to accelerate technology modernization initiatives. We provide ongoing opportunities for cross-agency collaboration through on-site training, interaction, learning, and market research. So welcome to all the attendees. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, before we begin, I do want to encourage everyone in the audience to submit questions of your own in the Q&A section of this platform. We'll be going through them um, a little bit during, the, during uh, Kelly's discussion and then some probably most likely at the end. So please send them in and we'll get to them for sure. I'd like to pass things over to Kelly Arts, our speaker for today, to let her introduce herself and get us started, though. Kelly? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Kelly Arts. I'm the Supply Chain Risk Management Technical Lead for the Federal Acquisition Service at GSA. I sit in the Office of Policy and Compliance um, in FAS, the Federal Acquisition Service. Next slide, please. Today, I am sharing with you an overview of the Cybersecurity Executive Order 14028. As you may know, the uh, regulatory environment works uh, where a cyber, uh, either executive order or a congressional uh, law is passed, then it moves to the Federal Acquisition uh, Regulation uh, Council. And then we get to uh, work to implement it at federal in the Federal Acquisition Service of GSA. So the cyber ex cybersecurity executive order is extremely impactful for GSA and for our vendor partners. There are several FAR cases underway to work to implement this executive order. You may know that, uh, many of you may recall the solar winds breach that happened a couple years ago. That was a wake up call for, for the US since nine uh, federal agencies were breached during that. It was a, a sophisticated hack, which we now believe was attributed to Russia, many sources uh, say. Um, and then they, they used an update um, to an existing Orion software. Uh, application that was already on many federal government networks. So what we see is a supply chain attack that was successful and used sophisticated techniques. What the government's doing in response is saying, we need to change this. The cyber war has moved um, to, to us in a new way. So the Cybersecurity Executive Order 14028 calls for bolstering cybersecurity in IT and OT, and we'll describe that a little later in the presentation. It also removes barriers to threat information sharing. We no longer will consider, if you're, if you're housing federal information, you'll no longer be considered a victim during a breach. You'll be part of the solution, which is further defined in uh, what we see throughout the executive order. It also calls to modernize and implement stronger cybersecurity standards. There's a, an open FAR case that actually takes all the cybersecurity requirements and makes its own part in the FAR. That's part of the effort uh, to implement the cybersecurity um, order. And then there's additional FAR cases that we'll be discussing later in the presentation that further defines cybersecurity standards and bolsters those. It also calls to improve software supply chain security. And you may know that NIST has done its job. They did what they said they would do in uh, what the government asked them to do in the cyber EO. And they've defined critical software. We'll talk about that. And it calls to establish a cybersecurity safety review board. Next slide, please. This is important because we realize that our adversaries are increasingly sophisticated and they've become successful. We see it um, not only in the breaches that we discover, but we're also aware of some of the techno technological advances of our adversaries, particularly China, where it seems to indicate that they've uh, been successful in stealing uh, certain technologies and then leapfrogging those with some of their advances. Foreign owned and controlled information and communication technology products also create vulnerabilities in the US supply chain. As you know, our US government is dependent on our vendor partners and it's a marketplace where we have uh, partners that could be 
uh, international. So it's an area where we have to, to focus to make sure that we are protecting our national and economic security. In the past, IT providers have been hesitant or unable to voluntarily share information about a cyber incident. They're obviously concerned about their reputation. This order, you'll see, it brings uh, more of a partnership focus to stop the follow-on attacks of a vulnerability. The private sector will be required to adapt to a continually changing threat environment to ensure the products offered to the government or in support of the government are secure. The plan for rules will ensure contractors keep national security interest in mind. And there's also some language that you'll see in an OMB memo that makes it clear that it's not just a requirement on the prime, but it, there's a requirement to flow down to all the subs. Next slide, please. Now this defined critical software um, and this, it, it's based on elevated privilege or a software that manages privileges, but it's not just that. It's also those that control access to data or operational technology, but it, it's, it's a broad definition that apply, applies to all forms of software, um, except for those in the audience that do research, there is a, a, a carve out for software so, used solely for research or testing in a, in a closed environment. Next slide, please. So for you, how you can assist the government in the requirements of this new EO, please know that it addresses both IT and OT. Um, we're moving to a proactive threat environment and the support that, that you could um, bring to the fight is to keep abreast of proposed updates to the FAR anticipate future solicitation refresh or mass modification or manual modifications of our contract language and know that GSA is in partnership with NIST, who's defining critical software as well as the secure software development framework. And then CISA, and those of you that watch industry listening sessions know that CISA has been engaged in some listening sessions to have to do with cyber incident reporting. GSA is aware of that. We're watching that. We're partnering with these other agencies to make sure that we're implementing the EO effectively. Please watch for GSA guidance and updates and attend training sessions as they become available. This was uh, NIST guidelines shortly after the EO. They published it in July 2021. There's 11 recommendations for software verification techniques. Um, and I'll let you go through those. The, since this, the date of July 21, excuse me, they've also uh, published a table that maps the uh, cyber EO requirements for, for software to uh, their software development, secure software development framework. Next slide, please. Now this slide is designed to help you um, see the overlay of how these are working together. This is public information. Uh, the first two columns are public information from acquisition.mil, which posts open FAR cases. The third column is taken from the public facing EO that shows what those particular sections of the EO are designed to address. So for FAR case 2021-019, this one is standardizing cybersecurity requirements for unclassified federal information systems. It's designed to address that scope federal information systems unclassified. The, the, the synopsis of what it will cover whenever it's out for public comment, it'll cover 2I and 8B of the EO. If you were to go to the EO and pull those sections, you would see that 019 for federal information systems will cover the scope of contractors and associated service providers to be covered by the contract language that's developed. It'll touch on the types of logs that will be maintained, required to be maintained, the time period that you have to maintain those logs, and the time period for agencies to enable recommended logging and security requirements. There's specific length, there will be specific language about how that data should be protected. Next slide, please. The other case that we want to go in detail on is 2021-17. This one is cyber threat and incident reporting and sharing information. This is a major rule, and by definition in the regulatory environment, a major rule means a billion or more of costs that's anticipated among government and our vendor partners. It will cover more aspects. It covers a greater scope, and it covers more aspects of the EO, and those are, are listed there. It, the Primarily, the, the message is that this is where the rubber will meet the road. 
to make sure that the cyber threat and incident reporting is timely and shared and um, more transparent than it's been in the past. And as I mentioned earlier, CIS is involved in working with uh, vendor partners to make sure that the requirements and the reporting requirements and where it's housed are more effective for the forensics that'll take place. Next slide. In addition, uh, the there we have an OMB memo that's come out, 2218. It was released just a few weeks ago. Um, it calls on government agencies to work to comply soon, and there's specific timelines that you'll see there. That MMO 2218 is also public facing. You can find it um, on the White House website. It uh, it requires us as agencies to work to comply with the NIST guidelines for using third party software. There's also a call out for those government agencies that make available government wide vehicles such as uh, the Federal Acquisition Service. So we're working with our um, policy advisors and OMB to make sure that we have a full understanding of what's required for critical software on our vehicles by the date that's called out in the OMB memo. Uh, there, is, there is some language that software producers will be required to attest that you're complying with secure software development practices which NIST has defined in 218. Next slide. So the scope of the EO the, is to cover that the need of the federal government to improve our efforts to identify, deter, protect, protect against, detect, and respond to threats and threat actors. The scope of the EO spans across IT and OT systems, no matter the type of operating environment, whether that's off-prem or on-prem. Next. These are just some examples of operational technology that's included in the definition for critical software in the CEO. There's physical access systems, which could be uh, the way that doors get locked and allow egress or ingress. There's tele telemetry and monitoring. And this is an example where it can, uh, a, a threat actor could impact the accuracy of a fuel level measurement which isn't that important if you're just driving a car, but if you're an airplane protecting US interests, that could be a more of a major uh, breach. There's a fire alert and suppression systems, whether the alarm um, is inactive and won't work as it, as it should, or whether it goes off uh, in, a, in a case where it shouldn't. Also IOT, many of you are probably tracking some of the electric vehicle movement in the regulatory space. There could be a destabilization of power networks or a theft of electricity, as well as fraud. Next slide, please. Now, why cybersecurity and Scrum is important, given this is, this is the name of your working group, I don't think uh, you need to be reminded of that. But certainly, um, we can't el eliminate risk entirely, but we do, do need to do what we can to reduce it and mitigate it. Next slide, please. Implications for industry, and uh, Nicole has shared with me that we're probably looking about half of the audience today is industry and half maybe academics. So just want to call out for you to please look for increased cybersecurity requirements and reporting mandates for sharing cyber threats and incidents. For those of you that provide critical software, you need to anticipate enhanced documentation to support com compliance with the new security standards. And there is uh, some discussion about SBOMs and how those uh, would be required, as well as software labeling. There's calls for public comment from NIST that you could pay attention to. Now the CISA is doing the listening sessions and GSA will have our own um, engagements, which I'll speak to more in detail later. Please expect modifications of contract language as the FAR cases become finalized. And then we're um, inviting recommendations to update compliance programs. Next slide, please. I want to show you a story in the life of a FAR case. So this is a, a, a depiction of a journey that a FAR case takes. And for our discussion today, we focused on 17 and 19. So you'll see when that case gets open, then it moves to a government coordination phase, which is the phase we're in now. That can be a quite lengthy process. And then we'll move into a co public comment period. Now, typically there's uh, 60 to 90 days where the public is invited to comment on a draft rule 
that's been issued. GSA will plan uh, to have industry listening sessions, not just for you to tell us what you think about the rule, but primarily for you to tell us the best way that we should implement the rule in the acquisition. So uh, we're looking forward to a lot of industry participation there. It is something that we, because we need vendor partners to, to keep the government going, we definitely need your participation in those listening sessions. Then it'll move, after comments are in, it'll move to another round of rulemaking for coordination, legal review, and to uh, consider all the comments and how we can address them as a government. Finally, the rule will move into the final uh, phase and be publicly posted. Then GSA and FAS will move to implement those rules. Many times what we, what we see is a need to um, do a mass modification and add a contract clause. Sometimes we require our vendor partners to attest that they have seen the clause or attest that their software that they're developing is following the standards that's defined in, by NIST. Next clause, please. Now we do plan to engage you prior to the final rule. When, the, when it comes out for public comment, you'll begin to see invitations to listening sessions. Senior GSA representatives will be charged to attend and um, we'll take notes and make sure that, that we capture uh, the input that you have for us on how best to proceed with these acquisitions and implementing these rules. Um, you can also uh, check that website that we put there for the link to keep abreast of um, new information about the dates. So uh, obviously collaboration is key. Uh, we can't do our, the work of government without our vendor partners. So this is how you influence regulations. You give public comments, you attend pu public meetings, Please listen, please attend our industry days and reverse industry day listening sessions. You can comment on the proposed legislation. You'll also have opportunity to collaborate within government, the comments that can include potential solution and revise FAR language. Sometimes in the um, reconciliation of public comments, specific examples tend to be best. Next slide. I wanted to give you just a couple links that you could go to to find out more on the FAR cases that we presented or any other SCRIM or CSCRIM related FAR case. There's regulations.gov and there's federalregister.gov. Next slide, please. I think in the beginning we talked about how the uh, cybersecurity executive, the executive order is driving several new FAR cases. Um, please know that it's an important process to ensure regulation making is public and transparent. And then this last link is um, a short version of where you can see summaries of the FAR clauses, and it's the source that we use to pull those that table that I presented to you. Next slide. I'm happy to take questions. If any of you guys do have questions that you want to share, you can put them in either the Q&A or the chat. Okay. Well, then with that, is there anything else, Kelly, that you want to add to kind of leave with the rest of the team that's here and listening? Um, I think I think there's a lot to pull from, from the slides and the links that are provided. Uh, I, it's a big change. These are these are made. This is a major rule that that we're working um, to prepare for. It takes a lot of coordination within government, and we certainly need our vendor partners to come with us on the journey. Perfect. Um, if anyone does have questions that come up later, please feel free to reach out to me, and I can forward them along to Kelly and her team to get them answered for you. But outside of that. Thank you so much, Kelly, for your presentation today. And thanks all of you guys for joining us. And hopefully we get to see you guys at ATARC's next event. But have a good rest of your day, everyone. Oh, Elia, I see that you raised your hand and we do have some questions coming in. So I will give everyone a chance to ask them now. Um, so one, Aliyah wants to know, one, if she can get a copy of the PowerPoint and two, if she can speak on, the, if you can speak on the 4N clause. Yeah, I'm, I appreciate that question. I, I believe the PowerPoints will be available with your 
recording, if that's right, Nicole. And um, then so sorry. I will be posting the recording of this event on YouTube. Um, so you guys will be able to see it there with Kelly's discussion attached. Um, but outside of that, if Kelly, if you are comfortable with me sharing the PowerPoint, then I can send it individually. Okay. How about I check with our OSC as I we talked about in the beginning and then I'll just get back to you. And then Aliyah on 4 in, I'm not able to comment on that. Um, it's not referenced in the, the two cases that uh, we prepared to present today. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, and somebody else mentioned, she said, no problem. Keith mentioned, um, will government be making a list of what software products they have determined falls within the EO? I don't anticipate that, Keith. Uh, what, we're, what we're working from is the current definition from NIST. Uh, and we're also involved in conversations to try to seek clarity on that. All right, that is all the questions we have for right now. And then Junie said, thank you for your presentation. Um, as well for me, thank you so much for joining us today. And if anybody does have any other questions, I will forward them along, but have a good rest of your day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you, Kelly.